Blessed are you, Jehovah, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth and um, sanctifies us with the blood of Yeshua. Thank you for this word that you've prepared, this bread, this daily bread, this manna. And Lord God, I ask that our hearts will be soft to hear what you have for us today, Lord. Lord, that is not um, my words that speak, Father, but ultimately it will be you. Um, you just give us time to you, Father, and I ask that you be here with us. I'm sure, pray. Amen. So, Bruce finished off last week with Yeshua coming to um, John the Baptist. And John the Baptist said to him, I'm not worthy to baptize you. And you should have been perfect, knowing that, you know, does he need to do this? He's God. But he humbled himself to that point. And um, he said, in order for all righteousness to be fulfilled, it's necessary that I do this. And he goes into that bapt baptism and comes out. And straight away, he then leaves for the wilderness. So I'm going to go through the chapter, maybe stop here and there, and then um, at the end there's some things I want to touch on. But let's see how, how the, you know, the Lord decides to take it. So then Yeshua was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. It's just a very interesting first verse. He's been led up for a specific reason. It's not just like, you know, he's going into the wilderness and he's going to figure out what he has to do ahead and so on. No, it's like literally there's a purpose for him going into this wilderness. It's for him to be tried and tested. Is he going to be found wanting or is he going to come out victorious? Um, and he is obedient in this. Um, the next verse says, verse chapter two, verse 2, it says, And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. It's kind of interesting that it just adds that afterwards he's hungry, you know. It's like, yeah, not many people have fasted 40 days. Apparently, a 40-day fast is the, basically the maximum a person can fast without causing um, severe bodily harm or permanent bodily harm. But he fasts here 40 days with no bread, no water. And that's miraculous. There's only a few guys in the Bible. Does anyone know who, who, what other people in the Bible fasted 40 days? 40 nights. Moses? Elijah? There's only two other guys. It was Moses and Elijah. Which is also interesting when we look at the Mount of Transfiguration. Those are the two, only two that come down and meet Yeshua. So he was hungry. He was at a point of physically he was very weak. You can imagine. Okay, being alone in the wilderness for 40 days, 40 nights for a specific purpose. The flesh can have a lot of strength if we allow it. If we continually feed the flesh, our physical bodies, and we don't focus on... Um, we made up of three parts, right? Body, soul, spirit. Here in the wilderness for 40 days, you can imagine that Yeshua was tried on all three of these. Okay? Firstly, he's alone. So he's got to bring his mind, he's got to bring his body in, firstly, yeah, he's got to bring his body into submission. Because his body wants food. He's got to bring his mind into submission. Because his mind is telling him, you know, this is what he needs. He's alone. Um, after, I imagine, a few, quite a few days of fasting, you're feeling extremely vulnerable and weak. And then spirit, he's got to bring his spirit into submission to the Father. And this is where we see the enemy, the adversary, the deceiver, the devil. He comes and he attacks Yeshua on all three of these. He attacks him physically, on, on the physical side. He attacks him on, the, on his soul, the, the mental side, and his spirit. For that specific reason, because he knows he's weak now. He's at his weakest point on all three of these. So he tries to attack. 
Now, guys, think of this in your own lives. We are continually bombarded or attacked on all fronts all the time. And the enemy is going to use that strategy. He used it on the Son of God. He's going to use it on us. So let's have a look here. Verse 3. Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, If you're the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. He knows he's hungry. He knows his body's weak. But it's not finished. So he says, verse 4. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He doesn't try have a discussion with Satan or with the enemy. Okay, you can either think of, of, of the devil or someone that's attacking you in life that's been used from the enemy. He doesn't try have a discussion with them and, you know, uh, let's have a long debate about this. He just cuts straight to the point. I'm not going to entertain this. This is not of God. And he gives them scripture. This verse comes from Deuteronomy chapter 8. Okay, confirmed. <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter 8. He goes straight to scripture, Torah, and he says, It is written, Do not tempt the Lord. Sorry, man shall not live by bread alone. Someone that's fasted for 40 days really understands the importance of food. I mean, I think you guys all know after Yom Kippur, one day fasting, you've never smelled food, smell so good, taste so good. Imagine 40 days, like... That's something else. So, straight away, that door shut in, in the adversary's face, in, in Satan's face. That door shut, okay? He's attacked the body. Food, all right? What's his next aim? Well, let's attack his, his mind, his soul. Then the devil took um, him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple. Verse 6. And said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angel charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Okay, so he quotes here from... Satan quotes here from Psalm 91. But can you see also his attack on the authenticate, well, authenticness of who Yeshua is? If you are, if you are the Son of God, if you are, it's trying to bring doubt into who he is. Now, can you imagine being Yeshua growing up? He had a specific calling, and I bet everyone here has doubted what their purpose is and what their calling is on their life. Many of you here don't know what the, your calling is, perhaps. But he grew up being told from young, you are the Messiah. Now he had brothers after him. Can you imagine? Like them telling him growing up, you're not that guy. Like, no ways. Mom and dad just think you're special. You're not that special. You know, you're the firstborn. You know, everyone thinks the firstborn special. Uncles and aunties going, is this guy really, you know? I mean, come on. Here again, Hasatan tries to um, bring that into doubt. Are you really the Son of God? If you really are, do these things? Come on. But he doesn't fall for this because he knows who he is. He doesn't need he doesn't need anyone to validate that. He doesn't need he doesn't need the validation from anyone. He knows his purpose and he's steadfast. So also what we've got to see here is that the enemy pulls a piece of scripture out of context. So he does give truth. He takes scripture which is truth, but he twists it out of context and he feeds it. And that's what he will do to us also. I'm sure all of you are sitting here have had those thoughts jump into your mind. But is it really that bad? Or but this or but that? But the context, once we really do introspe introspection on that, the context is not right. 
Verse 7. Yeshua said to him, once again, he gets straight to the point. He doesn't try to say, no, but I am the Son of God. He doesn't try to justify who he is or any of that. He just gets straight to it. It is written, again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. You see, he attacked his thinking, his mind. If you are the Son of God, you know, he takes him up to this high point, the highest point, the top of the temple. The temple that's supposed to represent who he is. He is the sacrificial system. He, is, he has come to deal with the sin of the world. And he takes him to this very point. And he says, no, just jump off here and you know, the angels will catch, him, catch you. Pride. Just, you know, call upon the angels. You God, aren't you? You can do anything you want. And he tries to get into his mind. He tries to bring pride out that um, he should have the authority to just, you know, do any of these things whenever he wants. Once again, he knows his purpose and the plan is there. And he rebukes him. Verse 8. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. The interesting thing here is that Yeshua doesn't say, no, all these things don't belong to you, they belong to me. Because at the fall, when Adam and, and Eve partook of that tree, they rebelled against God. Remember, God gave them the authority. He said, I give you the authority to rule over this place. They gave that authority over. Messiah doesn't try to argue with them. He says, yeah, the kingdoms of the world. The kingdoms of the world are yours. But he knows who his kingdom is and who his people are. And he says, I don't need that. Verse 9, he says, And he said to him, sorry, um, yeah, I'm just going to read from verse 9 again. And he said to him, all these things... I will give you if you fall down and worship me. And you shall answer him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. He attacks the spirit here. Your spirit is going to worship, that's what Satan asked him, worship me. It's a spiritual act. Or you're going to stay faithful. And once again, Yeshua quotes Deuteronomy chapter 6. I think it's chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Yeah. Um, six. Yeah, 6.13. And he says, no, you shall only serve the Lord your God. Now, how many have you, we've all, but just think about it. When you're in a, a place of weakness, here he's at the weakest point he's been. And we get these voices, or these, these ideas that we know are contrary to what we should be doing. Yet we allow it. Think of it. Um, stubbornness. We have an argument, and we just decide, I don't, this person's right, but I don't care. I want to be right. I want to be heard. We know what we should be doing, yet that voice comes and no, you're right. Even if you, you know, even if you've got that idea that, you, even if you can hear them, you're not listening. Or we have so many things, you know, we get cut off in, on the robot, you know, cut off by a taxi, and we have a, a, a raging fit at this person how can they do be so silly and you know be on the roads and 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 or we short with each other we short with our spouses we short with our kids and uh, because we've had a long day and we're tired or um we just we see something that needs to be done and we leave it for someone else to do even though they're tired these are little things but in our lives daily, we at work and we want to take a shortcut. 
on, on the project because it's going to take, save me time and I don't want to, um, no one's going to notice. Or, you know, whatever it is, there's many things in our lives that we are challenged with these things daily. Why? Because the enemy is going to challenge us if we are trying to walk the walk. The enemy is going to attack us physically, mentally, spiritually. And that's going to be a daily thing. If he did it to Messiah, he's going to do it to us. But the good news is that we have solid ground we can stand on. Messiah showed us what we need to do. He gave us an example. Do you think this passage is just here for no reason? He said, look, you're going to go through these things. What I've gone through, you're going to go through. But I've given you the tools to get through it. But you need to know the scripture. That's your job. I've given you everything. But if you do not know how to use a sword, when you go into battle, you're going to be taken out. You can imagine for many thousands of years, um, the soldiers are prepared for battle. They prepared for many years in how to wield the sword to be effective. Those that were best were those that practiced the most. They knew their sword, they knew the weight, they knew the center of gravity, exactly where you could hold it and it could balance perfectly. They knew exactly how, um, what stance to stand. When a certain attack came, what position to take. Perfectly they knew it. Because it was practice after practice after practice after practice after practice. Eventually it becomes muscle memory. I think any of you that have done a sport, kicked the ball, done some kind of martial arts, anything like that, done piano. When you put your hand to the piano, automatically they take place. And you play a song and you're not actually thinking about the, the, the keys that you need to press, but you'll, you'll automatically do it. That was Yeshua's response. He didn't have to think about it. It was automatic. We need to be at that position where it's automatic. We don't have, we have a very sly, deceitful adversary. Satan is going to get you at that point where your mind is over there. And he's going to come at the, at the point where you're weakest. You don't have the time to sit and try think about what you need to say. You sure didn't have to think about what he needed to say. It was automatic. He was trained. The word, well, it says here that this is a sword. This is our weapon. God does the rest. We just need to be prepared. So, We are going to go through trials, but those trials are for specific reasons. You don't sit and prepare for a war for 10 years for no reason. Hey? I mean, that would be, or even guys that do um, martial arts, they don't just fight, you know, train, 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 train for years to not put that to the test. Or people that play piano for years to not go and um, play before an audience. You're preparing for something. Now imagine that you were called up in the army. Let's, let's go back a bit where you, where you had to use swords. You were given your sword, you are given your little flint, your stone to sharpen it, you are given your armor, and, you're set, and they, they told you, the battle's coming. Okay, in the north, it's a big army building, they're making different alliances. It's, only a it's a matter of a year to two years, and they're going to start coming down. We've got the intelligence on it. Here's your weaponry. This group, you're going to go that side when this happens, you're going to go that side. You need to study the roots. You need to make sure that your armor is in tip-top shape. And then I'm standing there going, but I'm a farmer. I don't know how to use a sword. Well, you better get to know how to use a sword very quickly. 
need a bit of train. Do you think you, you're going to be on the front line? Do you think you're just going to stand there and go, oh, that's some nice, you know, weaponry. could be very useful in that fight. But I'm just going to go there and, you know, do what I know. Make some, dig some holes, plant some vegetables. Then when the war happens, I'll put my arm on. No, you're going to go, okay, that's what I did. But now I need to focus on what's coming because this is an imminent threat to my family. We hold the line. My family who are vulnerable behind me. I need to know how to use this weaponry to the best of my ability. So that when I walk in, no one can look at me and say, you let us down. Like, we were training hard. What were you doing? You, the line, you broke the line. They broke through you. So it's our responsibility to train daily. If we want to be successful in life, talk to any of the most successful people. There's a few rules that they keep to. Discipline. Extreme discipline. I listen to one guy on Impact Radio. He does little leadership um, talks. And one of them was touch the line. So, however many days a week he goes with his wife for a walk, you know, two kilometer walk. And at the end of the walk, there's like a few meters and then there's this, this line on the road. And every time he gets there, he bends down and he touches the line. Because in his mind, that's a mental, um, a mental point spit in his mind that it's completing it. It's completing the task. And then he gets there sometimes with wife says, just leave the line, don't touch the line, just once. Just, come on, you can do it once. He's like, no, I need to touch the line. <laughs> because it touches the line. So what does that have to do with this? If we, we need to be disciplined. How many times we get home, it's late, bath kids, work the whole day, bath kids, feed kids, read kids stories, put kids to sleep. For those who don't have children, it's coming. <laughs> okay, so, so prepare now so that when you're there, you're really strong. Okay, it's eight o'clock. Then you've got to bath, you've got to spend time with your wife, then you're tired. But, Okay, for me, I'm not a morning person. So some people go, I'm going to get up 5 o'clock in the morning and read. Spend time. I mean, I can wake up early. I just, yeah. It's not great. <laughs> it's not great. The kids are already waking up at like 6. So for me, that's early enough. Um, so at night, I try and make an effort. And there have been times where, um, many times where I've gone, oh, I'm just tired, you know. I'm just not feeling it. I'm just, you know, I messed up today. And I just feel distant. And that's exactly what the enemy wants. When you're weak, he's not going to attack you when you're strong. Here he attacks you sure when he's weak. And that's exactly what he's going to say. And you're, yeah, you don't need it really, really. Do you have to really read tonight? Well, do you really have to eat today? Do you really need to drink water? Do you really? Yes. How much more important is this? I often think to myself, you know, sometimes we get so caught up with life, heaven and what's going to happen all seem like kind of like, is this really real? Is this really going to happen? But the more you study scripture and the more you see prophecy being fulfilled, the more you see the truth in it. You come back to that realization, yes, it's absolutely real. This is absolutely a fight. This is absolutely necessary. And I often think to myself, what is my spirit man? We made a body, soul, spirit. What is my spirit man going to look when I stand before God? I don't know how many of you have watched uh, The Little Mermaid. Okay. No, not the new one. It's just the Little Mermaid cartoon. Okay, go back to your childhood. And you see King Triton. He's like this buff guy. 
really powerful. But Ursula, the enemy, tricks him. Well, in order to get his daughter back, he, I don't know, she does something to him. He turns into this like, little shriveled up dude. It's like this big. And he's like, eh, he can't do anything. I'm like, are we going to stand before God and be that little guy that's like so malnourished that if you had to poke him like snap and half? Or we're going to be like that King Triton, you know? We're going to be like the skinny guy here on earth, man, and get to heaven and be like, whoa, that, that heavy lifting was worth it. Like, I want that. I want to stand before God and go, do you know what? I did mess up. I did. And Baruch Hashem, we have Messiah. And Baruch Hashem, I pushed through because of Him. Not because of me. But I had to decide. I will submit. Yeshua didn't have to go into the wilderness for 40 days. 40 nights. But He said, I need to do this. I need to break this flesh. I need to break this mind. I need to break this spirit. It will be broken before Him so that He can breathe in us and bring that back to life and say, now, I can use you. If Messiah did this, who was perfect, showed us as an example what we need to do, how much more we need to look at this example and apply it. How many of us are sharpening our swords every day? How many of us are taking that sword out, putting that armor on? You know, the armor's got a name. It's called the armor of God. He uses the imagery because we are in a battle. There is a fight coming. There's many small battles. And there will be a war. There's a spiritual war that's taking place. If you look around what's going around in the world. It is a mess. And if we... The people that actually, you know, the people of God that actually know the truth behave like the world. What hope is there? What light is there? We don't have the time to mess around. The world is looking for any excuse to say that your God is not real. The world is also looking for light. And if we not light, what good are we? You know, God puts us into contact with so many people through our life. Maybe you don't meet new people every day, and maybe you do. What impact are we having on that person there? I'm not saying that we have to preach to them a message. I'm not saying to them we have to tell them our life story. And what God's done for us? No. I'm not saying you have to do that, but are you showing people compassion? Are we showing people God's love just in the way we greet them? Just in the way we handle ourselves around them? And this is hard because when we're in the workplace, we get into like this mode. It's like work. And we get used to this kind of rhythm of doing things and the people we're with. And I often like catch myself, you know, you, you at work, you have a meeting and then people are talking afterwards and you're talking to them and then I catch myself, I'm like, hey, like this is an opportunity where I have to be set apart. Where I have the opportunity to not engage in certain talk or change the conversation. But we get so in this rut of doing things that we just kind of continue. That's why we need to be trained. Because those might be the only opportunities we have to show people there's something in us that's different. Something that they would want. And then that gives the door to open up and share with them. Verse 11. Then the devil left him. And behold, angels came and ministered to him. It's going to be tough. This walk is not for sissies. You've got to put your armor on. You've got to train. You've got to know the word. You've got to have a relationship with your father. It's one thing knowing the word, and it's another thing having a relationship with him and knowing who he is. 
knowing his power that can float in you and change you. There's a difference between people, and I think those who have worked in industry for a while know, there's a difference between people that come out of school, or out of varsity, or out of anywhere, and they've got all this head knowledge, man, their heads are like this big, okay? Then, you ask them something practical, or to do something practical, and they don't even know where to start. We can walk around with a head this big knowing scripture, and do it totally wrong. Reflect Messiah totally wrong because you're not walking it. So sometimes it's better to have a smaller head, no less, but have the heart to do what's right. And often in this, you know, we talk about this messianic movement, this movement that wants to go back to Torah, wants to follow Messiah, walk in his footsteps, footsteps be disciples. Often this is a problem. We want to have these big heads of knowledge, but there's no love, there's no heart, there's no walk. We need to be that difference. We need to be, we are here to be like Messiah. Here Messiah quotes scripture where it's necessary, because the enemy knew scripture. But when he was meeting new people, he didn't go straight and, ah, oh, it's written this, ah, oh, it's written this. What did he do? He loved them. He fed them. He healed them. He tended to them where they were. That's what we need to be doing. And you know what, guys? It's a little thing. It's little things that build up. Where's the need? Have compassion. You know, it's, there's so many people like we drive around. And there's so many people on the streets begging. And we get so numb to it. What's oh, another beggar? Oh, just, I'm going to look this way. Please don't look my through my window. We get like that because it's just the need is so big. And we become conditioned to this hardness. And we need to be mindful of how we act around people. You know, Messiah said if you do to the least of these. If we turn a blind eye to the least of these, we turn in our eye from Him. We turn in our eye. We 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 neglecting what He's asked us. He says, "If you do that to that person, you're doing it to me." That's a hard reality, guys. Like just let that sink in. Because we've all done that so many times. That's a hard reality, but. We have so many opportunities that lie ahead that we can love people with the way he's called us to. Now, verse 12. Now, when Yeshua had heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali. So, the two tribes that settled in that area. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who set, um, sorry, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region and sh um, and shadow of death, light has dawned. So Messiah comes, just to fulfill the one little scripture. He comes to dwell in. The Galilee. And that great light is him entering and bringing light and truth. Verse 17 it says, From that time Yeshua began to preach and say, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Same words, you know, that John the Baptist, who was preparing the way before him. Repent, repent. Um, Bruce spoke about that last week. His his ministry was a ministry of repentance, John the Baptist. Messiah comes and says the same thing, repent. What is repent? That's the start. We are broken. When you realize your brokenness, 
and you fall on your knees and say, God, help me. Forgive me. Change me because I don't like this person. He meets you where he is, where you are. He meets you there. And he says, okay, I'm going to fix you. I've already paid the price. You are saying now you want it. It's a free gift. I'm bringing it. I'm going to give it to you. But there's something you need to do. You need to turn around. And you need to walk. You need to walk away from your old lifestyle. That old person now, you've put one nail in the cross. Repenting is taking the old person and putting him on the cross and putting a nail in. Saying, okay, I've got my first nail in. And every time we choose to be like Messiah and not to be like ourselves, we put another nail and another nail and another nail until that old person cannot move, cannot speak, does not have influence. But that's a process. It's one nail at a time. It's one decision at a time. Verse 17. From that time... Um, the read that. Yeah. Verse 18. And Yeshua walked by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And then he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Like, that just blows my mind, guys. Can you imagine that? Like, they knew Yeshua, obviously. They, they must have grown up with him a bit. They knew he was a rabbi. And he walks in and they're busy. It's like midday, you know, in your job. It's not like end of day, you know, I'm going home, okay, I can drop everything. They're like busy doing their work and he's like, hey, leave that stuff and come. Okay, bye guys. Like that's dedication. That's like something else. How they were able to just drop everything. They saw something in him. They understood something much deeper and they were like this wait i can imagine peter and andrew like looked at each other did did we just hear right did, he, speaking to us like we're just fishermen you see because as we know the rabbis would go to the best the very best students and they call them peter and andrew they weren't even trained and he goes and calls him. And at that excitement of that, that opportunity, they're like, we better go now before he changes his mind. He calls someone else and they drop it in their ransom. And they say, yes, we'll follow. They understood he was Messiah. They understood that he is worth more. A relationship with him, a walk with him, is worth more than all the fishing boats they could have and all the fish they could fish and all the money they could accumulate because all of that means nothing to the relationship you have with the God that created the universe there is nothing more real than that your relationship with God is something that was going to last for eternity it is the only thing that you are going to take with you into your heavenly retirement we put a lot of effort into this retirement and this world that is going to be 60 years, 70 years, if you're lucky, if you're blessed. But there's a retirement that lasts forever, all eternity. How much are we banking every month there? Just to put it in a turn that we can all understand. all understand how much are we investing in that retirement it's a hard question so they immediately dropped everything and followed him verse 21 and going on from there he saw two other brothers James the son of Zebedee and John his brother in the boat with Zebedee their father mending their nets he called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. And Yeshua went up to Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness 
and all kinds of diseases among the people. When, he, when his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all the sick who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, epileptic and paralytics, and he healed them. Great multitudes followed him from Galilee and from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. He didn't go out trying to give them a theology. He said, these people are broken. These people are dying. You don't go to someone that's had an accident with a mortal wound and their leg is off and it looks terrible and you bring a little plaster and go, well, I'll put this on for you. Would you like um, something to, you know, would you like a, a Coke or something? <laughs> you, you know, start talking to him about the latest movie that's come out and it's like his legs off. And this guy's like, I need help. I'm going to die. Yeshua comes in, he goes, what do these people need? Percy, they need truth. He is truth. They need to look upon someone that's walking and is not swayed by everything that's happening in the world. They're solid. He walks it. He is it. He lives it. They need food. Physical food he provides. They need, their bodies are broken. Think of the woman at the well, uh, the, the woman with the issue of blood for 12 years. Can you imagine how devastated her life was? 12 years you can't touch someone. 12 years you can't touch someone because you would make them unclean. Remember, they were very strict about this. Imagine not feeling someone for 12 years. Being hugged. You've been chased out your home. Your parents can't go live there, maybe. Maybe they're dead. Your husband's gone. You're trying to provide for yourself, but no one wants you because you're unclean. You can't go to worship because you're unclean. Everyone rejects you. Can you imagine how devastating it must be? How lonely that must be? And he comes to heal that, to bring restoration. He is the healer, spiritually, mentally, physically. We just have to recognize where we are and what we don't want anymore in our lives and give it to Him. It's a choice. That's it. It's a choice to move forward. It's a choice to hold on. But a few minutes, I want to just quickly touch on some similarities in this chapter. Okay, there. So I just went and, and listed some kind of interesting similarities that we see what happens here in Matthew chapter 4 and we see for instance in the Old Testament. So Yeshua fasts for 40 days and 40 nights. We see Israel in the wilderness for 40 years. That was their testing and trying and refining. We see Moses also, like I said, Moses and Elijah do a 40 day fast. Um, Gone through that. So, what is also interesting is that there are quite a few similarities between Yeshua and Moses. Now, he's going to go in and start his ministry. And I thought it would be interesting to see why I thought this is interesting. When the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious guys of that time come to him to talk to him and question him, what, what were they asking for? A sign. The interesting thing is, they knew all the characteristics of who he was supposed to be. 
They had it. God had given them everything. Throughout scripture it talks about who he is. Okay, he must be born in Bethlehem. He comes out of Nazareth. He comes from the line of David. Any others you guys can think of? Sorry? He's from the tribe of Judah. Is that what you said? From the tribe of Judah. Any others? Prophet like Moses. Okay, what did Moses do? Moses did incredible miracles that God did through him. Moses was a great leader, a great lawgiver. All these things, Moses tells them, there will be one like me that comes. You will follow him. They don't come to him and go, do you know what? I really want to know, is this a Messiah? They want to prove that he's not. The heart is opposite what it should be. If they truly cared, they would have been asking the right questions. Like, sorry, um, hmm, I've got some questions here, you know. Were you perhaps born in Bethlehem? Tick. Okay. Um, where did you come out of recently? It's a place starting with an N. You know, things like that. But they didn't care. They wanted to prove him wrong. They wanted to be right. So in Deuteronomy 18 verse 15 it says, The Lord your God will raise up, so this is Moses speaking, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. And many, um, so many Christians believe that this verse is prophetic. Many Christians and even the, re the people at that time, I'm not sure, but now if they still believe that's a prophetic, probably, they probably still believe it's a prophetic um, verse because they don't believe, I think, anyone as great as Moses has come. So this was like a major one. So he was a powerful leader. Sorry, let me rephrase that. Let me reread that. A powerful leader tries to kill them. Okay? Pharaoh tried to kill Moses when he was an infant. Herod tries to kill Yeshua, he's an infant. Yeshua, like Moses, fasted 40 days after baptism, after they went through the Red Sea. Um, there's that 40 day fast at Sinai. Both were prophets. Um, who spoke God's word to the world and performed signs and wonders by God's power. So not only, well, you should be the Messiah, he can, he did prophesy a lot of things also, which we'll see still to come. Both were great lawgivers, and uh, all the best next week, Billy, with chapter 5. <laughs> um, yeah, it's going to be difficult getting into that, that one in one session. Might take a few. Just look at Matthew 17 and Matthew 5. Well, he is doing Matthew 5. Both were priests who mediated between God and the people and offered sacrifices for their um, sins. Moses was a Levite who by God command, um, well, instituted the sacrificial system. So it was through Moses that God instituted the sacrificial system. Moses was a Levite. Yeshua, being high priest, also um, reinstituted a new sacrifice. All right, so Moses brought in the first Passover. Yeshua was the last Passover that we hold to. Both the royalty, okay, in the sense that Moses was raised as a prince of Egypt. Messiah comes from the line of David, king. Also, he is God, so he is ultimate royalty. Both were servants who obeyed God, who obeyed God's will, and suffered for the sake of the people. From this, just from these few, and there's many others, the, the the people, if they actually cared, they would see. And I would say the same thing now to all of you sitting here.
if we really care about Messiah, if we really care about having a relationship with him, if we really care about his will for our lives, he will show you. He will. Knock and it will be opened. Seek and you will find. It's not some trivial saying, some meaningless words that he spoke, but it's truth. If you really want to know your purpose, if you really want to live a life that is changed and has true value, I'm not talking about value, earthly value. This is nothing. This building, in a thousand years, you guys can come during the millennial reign and come visit the spot. Probably won't be here. Okay? Just think about that for a moment. Our mindsets have to change because we get so focused on this little box that we live in. There is so much more than our little life, our little property, our little job, our little mundane living. Those are things we have to do. But that's not who you are. God has an awesome plan for each one of us. If we take it. Alright? You apply for jobs. Or let's say someone comes to you with a job offer. An amazing job offer. It's your responsibility to take it. Okay, I accept. And then it's your responsibility after accepting that job offer to act it out. To do your job. Messiah has given us an amazing job offer. We can reject it and say, no, I like my you know, street sweeping. You know, it keeps me fit and I don't have to think about too much. Or we can take hold of this offer that's eternal. That is going to change lives. That is going to change. That is going to count. So, guys, look at the two job offers that are asked, that are before you, and decide. Because a double-minded man is un unstable in all his ways. Either choose to follow God, all your hearts, all your soul, all your mind. Or choose to do your own thing, but don't sit in between, because you're going to be a very miserable person. But I can tell you there's only one of those that lead to life, and joy, and peace. Is it going to be totally free from trials and tribulations? No. Why? Because God loves us, and it's those things that build us. If you went to gym, and you gymmed hard, and then you didn't feel sore the next day, you'd be frustrated. Because it's in that pain that you feel that you know there's growth. If there's no pain, there's no growth. There's no gain. Alright. I think I've spoken enough. Brokhishen. Guys, it's ultimately a button. Um, that's why we're here. And I want to encourage you. I want to leave with an encouragement that firstly, the first encouragement is that we are here together. This is awesome. Like, you guys are standing up. You are coming here. You're not here by chance. You, were, you decided today, I'm going to come and sit here. Why? Because I want to hear the word. I want to fellowship with people that are like-minded. So, well done for that, firstly. I just want to encourage you guys when you go out this week, keep your eyes on the things above. Try to be a little bit more loving. Try to be a little bit more compassionate. Try to train with your sword a little bit more. Okay. And be an encouragement to others around you. It goes a long way. There's a lot of people going through a lot of tough times. We need to be that good in the world. Shall we end in prayer?
Father God, I just thank you for who you are, that you are so loving, so patient, so kind, that you walk a long road with us. And Lord, although we stumble and we fall and we are immature at times and we are weak, you pick us up. You love us. You bear with us. You never give up on us. You never give up. Lord, I ask that you will soften each heart here. Lord, that the seed that's been planted today will not be snatched up by the enemy. But that will spring forth, will bring life, will bring fruit, and then that fruit will feed so many around each of the people here. And plant seeds upon those people to bring life, to bring you. Lord, we just give you glory, we give you praise, we give you honor. We humble ourselves before you and acknowledge that you are king. Lord, I ask that you go before each one here in this week to come, that you will be a shield of protection around us, that you will give us the strength to do what we need to do, that you give us the hearts that we need to do what we need to do. And Lord, that you will just show love to each one here. Abundant love. More. You have showed the ultimate love. You gave life, your life, the mere life. And may we just look upon that and be so grateful. Let's not forget, Father God, remind each one here of who they are in you, their purpose, what you've called them to do. Because we easily get caught up in our own plans. Lord, we give you glory and praise and honor. And Lord, I just ask that if there's anyone here that is not well, that is struggling with something, Father, that you bring complete and total healing in their lives, mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally, that we can call to you, that we can hold on to you. So we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your provision. I'm sure, pray. Amen. Amen.